bubble sort is sort of baby's first sorting algorithm. It's simple, it's slow, but it gets the job done. So here we've got side by side, we've got some code. I tried to keep the code matched up with what the dancers are doing. The dancers are also simulating bubble sort here. So the idea is that we've got an outer for loop, that's the for underscore or just blank in range, that loops over our entire list here. And then the inner loop loops over the entire list minus one. And the reason for the minus one is that we're gonna compare adjacent values in the list. We're gonna compare the pairs, like these two guys that just danced forward here. That line of code right there, right? X is I, is it greater than X is I plus one? If so, that means they're out of order. So we've gotta swap them. The last three lines of code there are just performing that swap. We got a temporary variable for the value at index i, and then we assign the value at index i to be the value at i plus one, and then we assign the value at i plus one to be what we stored in that temporary variable. And I'm gonna let this just run out a little bit longer and show the dancers simulating bubble sort, and then we'll talk about some other things. So you just saw my version of bubble sort side by side with the dancers. Here's a bubble sort off of the geeksforgeeks.org website. It's a little bit different. So first of all, and I don't want you to worry too much about this, at the bottom of the screen, their swap is all on one line. And I don't care for that. I find that to be not very readable, but you know, there's a comment saying what it does. So that is what it is. So just, just note that this is the swap right here and we don't need to worry any more about that. Now there are two loops, just like in my bubble sort, and there's an if statement checking to see if adjacent values are out of order and then swapping them. The one difference that I want you to pay attention to is this minus i right here. So I used an n minus one, and they're using an n minus i. And the reason they're able to get away with that is because every time bubble sort goes through one loop, it's guaranteed to bubble up to the top sort of the next largest value, assuming we're sorting from least to greatest. So if you have 10 items and you do one pass of bubble sort, one iteration of this outer loop, well then you know for a fact that the largest value has bubbled up to the end of the top of the list. So the next time you loop through, you don't have to go up to the 10th value, you can just go up to the ninth value. And then the next time just go up to the eighth and then the seventh and the sixth and so on. And that's what this minus i does. This is basically getting a little extra bit of efficiency out of the bubble sort algorithm. And here's a so-called optimized version from that same Geeks for Geeks website. Now it's optimized only in the sense that they're gonna perform this check using a swapped uh, true false variable, a swapped Boolean here. They're gonna check if when they loop through, were any of the values actually swapped, right? Was anything actually out of order? And if it wasn't out of order, then we're gonna break out of the loop because everything is already sorted. So these things give us a little bit of efficiency, but how fast actually is this algorithm and how are we gonna measure that? There's this thing called big O notation. It's a mathematical notation for describing the limiting behavior of a function, basically what the function does in the long run. Big O can be thought of as an operation that we apply to some function. So we can use a big letter O and then some parentheses and apply that operation to some function like say 2n squared. And we're professionals here so we use a crayon, of course. So what Big O would actually do to something like 2n squared is it's always going to ignore any coefficients and any constants and any terms that grow more slowly than the largest term. So order of 2n squared, and that's how we say, or big O, so either big O or order of 2n squared is going to be 
just n squared. We ignore the two out front. If we had big O of uh, five n cubed plus seven, well, again, we would just ignore the five and the seven and our result would be n cubed. Suppose we wanted to know what big O of n to the fourth plus n cubed is. Well, in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore all but the most fastest growing terms. So we're going to ignore the n cubed, and this is just going to be equal to order of n squared, n to the fourth, excuse me. So big O notation is kind of this friendly math where we get to ignore lots of details of things. One last point to make. Suppose we had big O of 2 to the n plus n squared. Well, we're going to ignore any but the fastest growing of these terms, and that's definitely going to be the 2 to the n. Whenever you have the base as a number and the exponent as a variable, that's going to grow faster than the reverse case, where the base is a variable and the exponent is a number. When we're talking about big O notation, we're not worried about little efficiency gains that can be made, little optimizations to a function. We're worried about the general behavior. So what is the general behavior of bubble sort? When evaluating any sorting algorithm, there's a few things that we usually look at. We usually look at what's the worst case of how long the algorithm will take in terms of time? What's the average? What's the best case? How much space is used, extra memory space? Auxiliary meaning memory other than the memory needed to store the list that's being sorted. The boundary cases, what are the extremes? Does the algorithm sort the values in place? Meaning, are they stored in the original memory location that they started in? Or are they saved in a new memory location? And is the algorithm stable? Meaning, if two values are uh, equal to each other in this sort, and they're next to each other, is there any chance that those values are going to get flipped or, or swapped anyway? So for bubble sort, we have a time complexity. In other words, how fast does the time it takes to run this algorithm grow as the list gets larger and larger, the list that we're going to sort? Well, if the list is length n, then the order is n squared, n times n here. And the worst case, which you can't read because it's off the screen, is when the array is in reverse sorted order. So it's actually when it's kind of in order, but backwards to what we want. So for example, if we wanted lowest to highest and it was sorted highest to lowest, that'd be the worst case for bubble sort. What's the best case scenario? Well, the best case is that we only have to make one th pass through the list, and we're assuming that we're using the most efficient version of bubble sort that checks to see if the list is already sorted. And the best case occurs when the list is already sorted, because we're just going to make one pass to verify that, and then we'll be done. Auxiliary space, how much extra memory is going to be used? And this is order one, meaning there is some constant amount of extra memory space that is going to be used. It's not necessarily one unit, like one bit or one byte, for example, but it is some constant amount of memory that does not depend on the size of the list. Actually, what it's going to depend on is the size of any particular value in the list, because that's what we need a temporary variable for in order to perform the swap. So what are the boundary cases? Well, we kind of mentioned these already. The worst case is when the list is in reverse sorted order, and the best case is when it's already sorted. Does it sort in place? Yeah, we don't create any new lists and copy these values over to them. We sort in the list that we're already given. And is it stable? Yes, it is. It's not going to swap two values that are equal to each other. And you might think, well, why would any sorting algorithm do this? Um, some of them do, and we will look at those. Let's look at one more example of bubble sort with some cards here. I'm going to take two pairs of cards up top and show that I'm comparing them. And then if they need swapped, I'm going to swap them. And I'm going to put up a counter of how many uh, comparisons have been made, because the comparisons are one of the major things that we're measuring when we're thinking about how efficient is a sorting algorithm.
I know that the largest value in the list has been moved up to the highest place in the list, so I'm going to mark that and I'm not going to compare with that one again. Notice how the largest value continues to bubble up towards the top of the list.